American Fugue, published by Traskin Press. If, as the saying goes, the past is a foreign country, then he had been exiled to his territory for many years now, a foreigner, alone in his own country. He had to leave, to place at least an ocean in between the past and the present. That's why he was going across to the new world, to a country in which the pursuit of happiness is enshrined in the Constitution. He was not going in order to explore a new country, but in order to abandon himself to her liberating power for the possibility that she could put out the second heart whose beat measured the past constantly inside him. The light fell vertically. He was possibly the only one with it on. He opened the wallet. There, in the coin compartment, the last melatonin pill. He swallowed it with saliva. He looked around 180 degrees. Window. Eye. Emergency exit. In the net on the back of the seat, a magazine with a canary on its cover. On the small screen, a Hollywood movie, all black and white, a scene inside a mine. He watched for a while, suddenly a spark, the mine, the canary, the canary in the mine. Old-time coal miners who, before entering the tunnels, would lower a canary to check if it was safe. If there was not enough oxygen, the bird was the first indicator. It would die. Sleep refused to come. He opened the newspaper to find out what was going on for the dispatches he would have to send back. The swift boat veterans cast doubts on Kerry's record during the Vietnam War. Photo of Kerry, tall, stiff back, dry. Further down, Hurricane Ivan will hit Florida. The Midwest is not anywhere near Florida, he thought, about as far as Poland from Greece. He was not heading to a country, but to a continent. In a few hours, everything would be 10,000 kilometers behind him. He was sending himself to the biggest mine in the world, like a canary check if there was oxygen. He was not yet forty years old and his parents were dead. That is, his mother was dead. His father was dead only to him. They had not spoken to each other in eleven years. Nothing. Silence. His wife had left him. I don't feel we are plural anymore, she said. What plural? he had asked. I, singular. We, plural. They had not made love in the ten months before their separation. He could not. Not anymore. He had no kids, almost no friends. He lived only for himself. How is it to live for yourself? Like there is no God, no universe, no humankind, no life on earth, no heaven, no hell. Everything a dream. An endless, dark, stupid dream. He took out his pen. He wrote a single word. Ego. I. He scribbled it out immediately and rewrote it. This time with an omicron. Ego. Ego. The word with his closed letter, the Omicron, a cage full of blood and memory. As he wrote, the light, in sync with the small bumps of the plane, repeatedly cast shadow and light upon his face, as if an invisible pen were drawing lines and roads directly on his skin. He was a writer. In other words, the window, the aisle, and the emergency exit all at once. The third flight was the shortest, Chicago to see the rabbit. Iowa City, despite proudly carrying the name of the entire state, did not even have an airport. After 22 hours in the bellies of airplanes at the bars of airports, he was at least reaching his destination. He looked down at the landscape. An infinite flat expanse. Antonioni's Zabriskie point jumped into his mind. Through the earphones, Dylan, I'm walking through streets that are dead. Walking, walking with you in my head. My feet are so tired. My brain is so wired, and the clouds are weeping. The clouds are weeping. He looked at the last faint traces being cut up by the wind. The clouds were dissolving, retreating into the sky, and the ground was beginning. Ladies and gentlemen, we are landing in a few minutes. Our captain, Marshal Fugelman, and the crew wish you a pleasant stay in Iowa. He turned again to the window. He was unable to focus his attention anywhere other than the aluminum crosses in the windows of the dispersed houses below, like crosses of martyrdom washed clean of blood. Something cold, human, old, yet a newspaper, number six, polar cold, snow on the ground, February, his winter coat on, alone, shivering beneath, the house blinking like a Christmas tree, she's inside, he outside in the cold, watching, what? Nothing in particular, he just watched. Ever since he was a child, he was the one watching, listening, observing, daydreaming. 
He turned up the volume of the music to dispel the memory. Impossible. When we were browsing each other's faces, he remembered one of her letters. This is the price of being a writer, being pursued by the past mercilessly. If he were a mechanic, it would have been difficult for memory to affect him so strongly. There are cures for people of action. Things are more difficult for those who live inside their heads. By the time he got back to the small apartment he was renting, he had already caught a nasty cold. But it was not the cold that held him for the next four months, first in the hospital and then bedridden. Body and soul were now living two different lives. He was Prometheus in reverse, had chosen his own punishment. The vulture ate not his liver, but his heart. He lived chained to an alien creature, his body. So many small deaths. Was it important which one would be the final? And truly, he had come close to death, but he lived. And there in the hospital at home, he went over everything in his mind. Some acquaintances came to visit him, mostly because they felt obligated. And on the third day, she came as well. And in the half hour she stayed, she cried nearly the whole time. For him, it felt like the weeping of a mother or a sister, an older sister. It was the last time he would see her. When the doctors allowed him to get up, he spent the first two weeks in front of the TV. He watched six movies per day, his favorite directors, alphabetically in reverse. He began with Hitchcock and Psycho, and ended with Antonioni, who else, and his profession reporter. At some point in time, someone, it seems, remembered him. He was asked to give an interview. The subject would be white, they told him. White as in blank paper, he asked. White in general, if to you as a writer it evokes blank paper, then you can talk about blank paper. He said very brave things, that it had never happened to him, that rather the opposite, he was always too full of ideas to pursue them all. Lies. For the last six years, long before his illness, he had been struggling to finish a novel. He would sit in front of his keyboard like an angler with his fishing pole over the water. <coughs> Nothing would bite. The screen would remain blank. Slowly he began to go out. First the corner store, then a walk in the nearby grove, led later to the city center. But he was no longer the same person. He seemed to have lost all ability to participate in life. Nothing affected him. He observed the world around him like a naturalist and field research. Totally disinterested in things that he used to care about deeply, he had found a little corner of the universe in which to exist. Certain events in his immediate family, the few family members that were left, did not even touch him in any way. He lived silently, not writing, observing. At some point, however, this superimposed Zen began to crack. His old self started to squeeze in through the fissures. Thank <laughs> you.